this video. So take a listen to this. And church has been the worst. I, I will not do church anymore. I love God, like you said, and I have a relationship with God, but you won't see me in nobody's church house. Not giving them nobody, not my tithes, not giving 10% to nobody, period. Found and I've come into contact with people that really just shocked me. Like, really? 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 You doing that? Really? Oh, okay. Oh, oh. Ooh. People are using the church as a business now. It's not, it's, I don't see nobody after the heart of the, or the, the souls of the people or anything like that. They're more concerned about personal gain. Now, I don't know if she was talking about Jamal or not, but she never had any of those conversations until after she broke up with him. So, you guys heard the audio of R&B singer Tweet. And so, dear friends, th this is what this, this is what led me to this video. Now, to be clear, to be fair, and in full transparency, these comments were made by R&B singer Tweet. They're not recent comments. However, they're new to me and recent to me. Someone sent them to me and I heard them for the first time the other day. And as I listened to it, all I could do was just be angry because hear, hearing a person say something like this, it helps you to see how false teachers and false shepherds are dangerous and how their influence, it just spreads like gangrene. How their public words, their public actions, along with their private words and their private actions that we don't even know how grave the consequences are that are oftentimes felt long after the fact. I just told you, those two aren't romantically involved anymore. However, when you look at not just Jamal, but just false teachers in general. We, we are still dealing with the aftermath of the Kenneth Hagans of the world and his false teachings, right? We're still dealing with the aftermath of Charles Finney. We're still dealing with the after effects of the blasphemous teachings of Carlton Pearson, James Cone, E.W. Kenyon. And then you have an entire slew of false teachers who are still alive, those three, are, they, they are gone, but the ones that are still alive who have done major damage and are still doing major damage to the body of Christ. Individuals such as your Rick Warren, your Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Creflo Dollar, Brian Carr, David Taylor, Stephen Furtick, Rod Parsley. How long, how long y'all want me to go? How, I mean, how, so many of these individuals are fleecing the flock for selfish gain. And so I am doing this video because love warns. And as I listen to what Tweet had to say, I have to be honest and say, I get it, sis. I get it. I understand exactly where she's coming from. And if I had a behind the scenes look, just a glimpse of the tomfoolery that she probably witnessed going on in the life of Jamal Bryant and all his preacher homeboys, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with the church either. I'd be like, yeah, see, I'm, mm, I'm good on all of y'all. I wouldn't want to give my time. I wouldn't want to give my time, my money, or my attention to such a wicked and shameful example of what it means to be a Christian. Like Tweet literally said, church has been the worst. And then she also said, she's not going to church anymore. She also said um, she's not going to church anymore and that she loves God and has a relationship with God, but you won't see her in nobody's church. This is a direct quote from what this woman had to say. And I want to, I want to read a direct quote, not just from her, but from her daughter. Her daughter said, when I talked to certain elders who be up in my DMs, some of y'all's pastors, I have to remind them who they are and they'll be surprised that I'm celibate 
or no, I don't want to drink. I'm good. That's what broke my heart. This is exactly what she said. Like, you should already know how to do right. Why aren't you doing right? I'd rather just stay in the world. My friends, what a scathing rebuke. Like, what a scathing rebuke. A, a scathing reality of someone who has to remind the man of God how he is supposed to be acting. It is shameful, but the question is, are we surprised? I mean, I know I'm not. I told y'all I was knee steep, knee deep in churchianity culture, so I'm not shocked. But here's another quote. Now, this one is from Tweet. She says, people are using the church as a business. People are using the church as a business. Then she says, I don't see nobody after the heart or the souls of the people or anything like that. They're more concerned about personal gain instead of gaining the souls and that's instead of gaining the souls and that's what's sad. I hung up my shouting shoes for the church. I will shout my way right in my house or in my car or in the mall or whatever, but you won't see me in my no pews. You won't see me in no pews. I'm sorry. Until you use your gift for that, instead of monetary gain, the church is going to continue to decline. This is what she said. My friends, there are no lies detected in, in, in any of these statements. I don't think y'all realize it, but tweet without even realizing it. She just described how the Bible describes the goal and aim of the false teacher, which is what personal gain. They literally do what they do because their God is their belly, right? Their, their view of church, the, the church is an apparatus for selfish gain for them. The, the gospel is not their primary concern. Their primary concern is to exploit people in the church for their own selfish ambition. You, you just look at the word of God proving itself to be true. But here's the good news. And, and I, don't, I don't know if Tweet will ever see this video. But the good news is that Jamal Bryan is not a member of the body of Christ. Well, would you look at that? Right. He doesn't represent his bride and he's not part of the church. What, what, what Jamal represents is black churchianity. OK, that's the category. I have defined it and I am placing it. I'm placing him in it. And that's just where he is. He he is one of the disciples of darkness that do the bidding of this, his father, the devil. And this is why he can't live right. This is why he, he can't be chased. I mean, this, this is why. This is why he must push harmful policies, right? Harmful policies, harmful ideologies, harmful agendas to his own people. This is, this is why he will continue to push the envelope and say things like, well, you know, Jesus was out of order 85% of the time of his ministry. And then he don't even feel bad about the contextual harm and the implications of making a statement like that. Like he doesn't even see how when you say stuff like that, how that tramples on the deity of who Jesus is and his holiness and his sinless perfection. Why would you even want to make a statement associating the miracles of Jesus and how it may have been different or, or, or revolutionary for the time, but saying how Jesus was out of order. Why would you say that? Tweets sentiments regarding the church. I would have to agree. They are partially true. I would agree that the, the church of churchianity. Yes, ma'am is the worst. They represent the most rank display of hypocrisy, sexual immorality, thievery, covetousness, just lying, boasting of all kinds of folly, 
passions of the flesh, you name it, they got it over there. Absolutely. They they are just all together morally bankrupt. And so, yes, I agree with her 100% in that regard. But here, here is what I would say. I would, I would also say that many people who often look to the behavior of the charlatans like your Jamal Bryant's, and then based on that experience, they will disavow the church altogether. And so if, if you knew, if you knew as, as like a pattern of ministry, if all you knew was the Jamal Bryant types, then yes, I can see why you would be done with church. Totally understand it. Why? Because Jamal, unfortunately, he is the visible archetype of what many people believe the church is is to a lot of people that is Christianity to the unbelieving watching world. Jamal is the church, but praise be to God that Jamal is not the standard and that according to scripture, he doesn't even qualify. And that's why we don't claim him, right? He doesn't qualify as a pastor and he doesn't even fit the description of a Christian. So guess what? We are free. We are free to place him in this other category which is the category of churchianity. And, and to that, there's a clear division between the holy and the profane, and it's just made self-evident all by itself. So that's the good news. Because he Jamal wants, he wants to talk about public restoration, yet he forgets that the Bible is what determines what that restoration would look like. Like you don't get... You don't get to be restored just because you say that you should be restored. Like you just like, I'm going to restore myself, right? You don't get to be in charge of your own restoration process. It's not how it works. And then first, we don't even see fruit that you were even saved, sir. We don't see that. L like the idea that you even know the God of the Bible is highly questionable. We don't need to know you personally. I don't need to ride in the car with you. I don't need to have lunch with you. I, we don't, we can't discern anybody's heart. We cannot do that. But all we have to do is allow him to open his mouth and listen to him talk. And he will tell the whole world everything that we need to know about his spiritual condition. That's the beauty of checking the fruit. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And his own words, they tell us repeatedly, like over and over again, that this man does not know God. Now, if the folks over there who, what I say, the folks, the ones in charge of the delegation uh, of the United uh, Unified Church in Church Fellowship, right? If they want to restore him, they are free to do so. They are free to do that because I mean, if we're honest, they don't believe or follow the Bible anyway, so they can do whatever they want. And I hear over there in, uh, what's the name I called it? I, I, I wrote it down. There's a whole, I call it the delegation of unified church in churches. Yes, that's, that's their, um, their convention. We'll just call it the unified, the delegation of the unified church in churches. I hear that they like restore people like every, every week, right? Like people like Jamal every week, you know? Now, now none of what they do is valid or has any, any validity or anything to do with the church of the living God. But they, from time to time, even they will sit a person down, like kind of for the sake of appearance. And then eventually they will put that person right back in ministry, leading over people like nothing ever happened. They do it all the time. But over here, where the members of the, the body of Christ who love God and who love his word through the authority of God's written word, we're the ones that are compelled to have no fellowship. Like my, my, my wonderful person in the super chat said, no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather... We are to expose them. That is exactly what Ephesians 5.11 teaches. Exactly what it teaches. Matter of fact, it goes on to say, for it is shameful to even speak of the things that they do in secret. Who is the they? 
Who's the day? Let's go ahead and look at the text. We're going to go ahead and look at Ephesians 5, 11, then I'm So let's go. Ephesians 5, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. If not, just listen, here go. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let's just stop right there for a moment. Like before I let, before I let Paul continue, I don't want you guys to miss what he just said, right? Like it's right there in the text. He is literally contrasting the behavior of one set of individuals with the behavior of another set of individuals. Like did I, I don't know. I, I, I saw that. Did you, did you guys see that in the text? It was kind of like right there. It's right there. He talks about sexual immorality, all impurity and covetousness. And that's descriptive of one set of sin sinful behavior, right? But then notice, notice how he says, these things must not be named among you. Then he goes on to contrast that behavior with another group that he identifies as saints. Like he is saying that this first set of adjectives, that type of behavior, that's not supposed to be named among the people of God. But that behavior, not named among the people of God. Meaning there is supposed to be, that, is, that whole idea of those descriptions are foreign to God's people. It is not supposed to be the status quo. People should not hear the name Christian or Christian pastor and it be synonymous with whoremonger, liar, thief, greedy swindler, adulterer. I don't know, just to name a few. Those are not supposed to be adjectives describing the people of God. But then it goes on to say, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this. And here you guys, here's where I notice the apostle Paul, he makes it very clear that the consequences and the end result of those who actively are complicit in those things. Like I, when I read that, I just mentioned that it says that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetousness, that's an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God in Christ. Kingdom of Christ and God. Sorry, I'm not dyslexic. So here, the apostle Paul is telling you that the kingdom of God does not belong to this group of people. Like they can hoop, they can holler, they can have five fake prophetess tackle them down right there to the ground at the pulpit. It will make no difference. It won't make a difference at all. The scriptures are clear that the behavior of such ones do not yield an inheritance in the kingdom of God in Christ. But then Paul goes on to say, let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Y'all, it's the empty words for me. It's the empty words for me. Like these people will pontificate empty words and these empty words all the time are because they don't even believe the words that are coming out of their mouths. Like literally Jamal said it at the end. It was real slick how he slid it in there. He quoted some other gentleman who said that preachers, you know, are the last ones to believe, you know, what it is that they preach. Now I would deny the Bible categorically does not teach that, but for the church end, absolutely. That can be true. They don't believe the words that are coming out of their mouths. And not only do they not believe them, the words are empty because the truth of their words don't even bear out in their own lives. They don't bear out in their own lives. But then it goes on to say, it literally says 
that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. It doesn't say you need to pray for the sons of disobedience. Now you can, you can pray that they repent and that God has mercy on them. However, the scripture spent a great deal of time admonishing us, the bride of Christ, to do a few things. So let me finish reading because we're going to break it all the way down. The first thing is we are given this imperative. Here it comes, y'all. It says, therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. We, you guys, the ecclesia, the true ecclesia, the called out ones, this is who we used to be. And the Bible here is wanting us to don't become partners with them. Meaning I'm not covering for you. I'm not visiting your church. I'm not holding hands and doing kumbaya with you. No, I'm not explaining away your foolishness. I don't even want to be associated with any aspect of what Jamal Bryan and those like him represent. Why? Because we are not the same. And I and others like me, we are not better than him. That is not it. But it's because we've come to the end of ourselves, because we've been broken and we died to sin, that Christ shall reign and that we shall reign with Christ. We don't want others to be confused and we don't want to be lumped in with Jamal or his kind. So, yes, I make content like this because people need to know the difference. They need to see, oh, well, this thing over here is not like this thing over here. There's, there's this distinction. It's a difference. But let me continue. Paul then says, walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right. Meaning, when we're walking in the light, like the fruit thereof will be all that is good and right and true, right? It's not filled with lies. It's not filled with deceit. It's not a bunch of gaslighting and smoke screens to distract you from what's really going on. No, mm -mm, that's not it. But then Paul says, and trying to discern what is pleasing to the Lord, meaning learn about the character and nature of our Lord. And everything that aligns with him, that's how you'll know what it's pleasing. But then the text gives us, the text gives us another imperative. It says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So my question is, what does the term expose mean? Like, what does it mean here in this context? Expose means either to reprove or to convince through argumentation and discussion. And so what, what does reprove mean? Reprove means to scold, to criticize someone for their actions or their behavior. It can also mean to show a strong disapproval or to disprove of something. So that's what this video is all about. It serves two purposes. It is to one, to call Jamal Bryan to faith and repentance in Christ alone. Why? For the remission of his sin. And then also to let individuals like Tweet and others who have been exposed to the dangers and the harmful effects of false teachers like Jamal Bryan, that he is a counterfeit. I'm going to finish up. The text says, for it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. Y'all, this is Tweet was trying to tell us when she was like, oh. Oh, this, this, this what you, Oh, oh, okay. That's, that's how y'all doing. She got to call it out. It is shameful to even speak of the things they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible for anything that becomes visible is light. So basically y'all. Basically, everything that has publicly 
I ain't in, I'm, this ain't Tasha Kane into digging up your stuff. Now, if I see y'all on the side of the road, I'll be like, repent, homie. I ain't going to go run and be like, ooh, I saw Jamal with some chick. No, be like, you, bro, you need to repent. Everything that has come out. Everything that has come out. The reason why it is done, it is to expose people to the fact that God does not represent that. Right. He doesn't represent God. God's not all up in that. Like his works are works of darkness and they are not to be ignored by God's people. It is to uncover so that we might see that his actions right? Like this and everything else has come out to prove that that individual is a child of the devil. They are not from God. Okay. So the videos like this and others, they are simply attempting, I would argue to obey scripture and to be found faithful, right? This video, it is for tweets and for people like her because she's not the only one. There are so many people who are out there, who have come in contact with pastors like Jamal Bryant. And then after being exposed to them, they just can't bring themselves to be associated with anything religious anymore. They're like, mm, I'm good. I don't, I'm, y'all can have all of that over there. And I get it. I completely understand it. But while I can have compassion and empathy for what Tweet said, also, I have to lovingly tell her and others who feel just like she does, there is some hard hidden truths that I got to get it out. I get it. Jamal is a wolf. And your experience with him and pastors and church folks like him, I know they put a bad taste in your mouth. I get it. But here's the reality. It was supposed to. It was supposed to put a bad taste in your mouth so that you can know under no uncertain terms that what they claim to believe and who they claim to profess, that that is a counterfeit. It wasn't even real. God wasn't in it. His name was nowhere represented anywhere up in that. Now, there's also some bad news. There's some bad news because I gave some good news earlier. Like we don't claim him. Yes, that is true. But there is some bad news to this. And, and the bad news is that although Tweet's assessment is right and she has told zero lies about anything that was said, the bad news is that her words cannot be used as an excuse for her to categorically deny any sort of connection to the church universal. And then yet at the same time, claim to love God and to claim to have a relationship with him. Let me explain what I mean. And I want to be careful in how I deal with this, but I have to be truthful and I have to be consistent with what the scriptures teach. You cannot say that you love God or you love his word and then have no love for the bride of Christ. If you love God, you will also love his bride. And your love for his bride will look like you doing whatever you got to do to distance yourself away from the imposters, like the counterfeits, the churchianity crowd. But it will also drive this deep desire inside of you to, to search out and connect with the true people of God. You won't rest. You will yearn to be part of of the body of Christ by way of a local expression known as a solid and healthy local church. That is a fact. But yes, you, you won't want any parts of the foolishness known as churchianity. And this is super important. And it's important because the Bible knows of no category of a lone ranger, just a rogue Christian, just out here talking about it's just me and my Bible and that's it. There is no such category of believer that says, you know, well, I worship at Bedside Baptist. Like that's unacceptable. And, and, and you and all your churchianity hurt it is real. I've been there. I've experienced it myself, but it doesn't let you off the hook. It doesn't let you off the hook to relegate your faith 
to some hermit temple of praise either. No, you can't do that either. Because the truth is that I can spend an hour talking about all that is wrong with Jamal. And, and indeed I have, but it doesn't absolve any of you. You know who you are, who are listening to my voice. You know, you're not connected to the body of Christ like you should be. And you have yet to open up your Bible and seriously read it for yourself. Like you may be listening to this and you may agree with everything I said, but now up until this point, this video is not your way of escape to say, see, this is why I don't fool with them church folk. No, mm -mm. neither is it your opportunity to avoid spiritual accountability either. You, you cannot grow into a spiritually mature believer apart from being connected to the bride of Christ. How are you abiding in the vine, which is Christ? And you don't even have a desire to be part of his church, which is his body. You can't separate one from the other. Prove it in the Bible and then we can talk. Twee says she is done with the church and I hear her. But I would argue that either one of two things is true with that statement. Either Twee can see the shenanigans and she knows that what she was exposed to is not a true reflection of what the bride of Christ is supposed to be, right? So she's distancing herself from that. And with that said, it is possible she's just, you know, spiritually immature and that with time, the Lord will soften her heart and he will lead her to a healthy church or... This part gonna hurt. Or Tweet is no different than Jamal in the sense that she too is a churchian. Meaning her daughter speaks of that time when she was fully committed and just wanted to live for God, right? So I'm gonna give you an example of what could be at work here. We don't know. And I'm, I don't, I'm not talking about this in a, in a disparaging way toward her, but it's more so of a category that I see often. So in Mark chapter, chapter four, right? In Mark four, Jesus is teaching by the way, uh, the, the, beside the sea, this very large crowd gathered around him, right? He goes, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow and he sold some seed, fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil, and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain and other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding 30 fold and 60 fold and a hundred fold. And he, this is Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then Jesus goes on to explain the purpose of the parables. I'm going to skip on down. And he says, do you not understand this parable, how then will you understand all the parables? He says, the sower sows the word. And these, these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in, choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 
30 fold and 60 fold and a hundred fold. My friends, when a person hears the word and they hear it and they receive it with joy, but then something happens, like for example, in this case, in, in this case, some false professors were, were in her purview, right? And after she witnessed how they get down, she was like, oh no, I'm good on all of that. And then it leads her to disavow the church altogether. My friends, that's a telltale sign that no matter how right she is about Jamal and the pulpit pimps like him, in the eyes of God, according to the biblical standard, she's not that much different than him. And that's the part that I realize that when you hear it, it stings the most. I get it, my friends. You are deceiving yourselves if you believe that you can love God apart from loving his bride. We can move, we can move it aside from tweet for a moment. If anyone believes that they can love God, but not be held accountable to his word, just like Jamal, you're deceiving yourself. Mm -mm. What do I mean? Th there are many people who love or, or who, who, what I would say with the Lord has opened their eyes and has helped them to see that pastors like Jamal are counterfeits. However, what they don't do is they don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and they work hard to grab that baby out of that murky, nasty bathwater and then they toss out that stinking, nasty, filthy bathwater, but they hold and cling on to the baby. In that video clip, where you heard R&B singer Tweet provide some scathing commentary about the church. She was very clear in her words. She, she wasn't speaking in veiled language. You heard her say, I am done with church. She doesn't have or want to have anything to do with the church. Why? Because she has firsthand witness account of exactly how these false teachers, these false shepherds, and these false brethren move in and through the church. And it was just, it was just team too much for her. She was like, nope, I'm good. I am so good on this foolishness. I don't want no parts of it. And I get that. Lord, y'all hate fruit fly season. I can't stand it. But y'all, Sweet in her own words, unfortunately, was exposed to the pulpit pimpery shenanigans and she didn't realize, she didn't really realize that the Lord was using that to show her, okay, yes, you don't want any parts of that mess. She is right. It is an absolute mess. Right, like if you only knew the trifling ways of how these preachers move, it is shameful and blasphemous. And I wish, I wish just so many of them would just stop calling themselves Christians. Like come up with a new name, like for what it is that they have going on. That's why I call them churchians and I call it churchianity. But the bad news is that God in his sovereignty he allowed her to see with her own eyes the counterfeit. But the question that needs to be asked of her and so many others is, do you have a desire to be connected to the real thing? Because I know I can speak for myself and so many others who have traveled on this churchianity journey. And it's the fact that despite everything that we saw, despite everything that we experienced, the desire to hunt and search out and find a biblical expression of the bride of Christ, like this side of heaven, that became one of my, my top priorities because I, and many others like me recognize that biblically that is the will of God. It is the will of God for believers to fellowship, to worship, to publicly proclaim and to hear the word of God preach so that we can grow into the spiritual house that God has ordained for us to be. That is how believers are equipped for the work of ministry. It's not done all by yourself on the side of your bed. 
It's not done by yourself in front of the TV streaming somebody else's church. No, it is done in the context of the gathered assembly of believers. We, we cannot expect to be effective and to make other disciples if we are off alone, all by ourselves, with just a prayer and a Bible in our hand. I get it, y'all. This is, this is a hard one. I struggled. I was like, if I say this... There's going to be folks that be like, I still don't like it. And now I don't like you. That's fine. I didn't start YouTube to have friends and to be like, I started YouTube because I want to be found faithful. Find me a New Testament example of someone isolated and disconnected from the body of Christ outside of imprisonment for the cause of Christ. And then I will concede the argument. I don't need to be right. I just need to be biblical, Right. Every, every epistle of the New Testament was written to believers and it was written in the context of a local assembly. Like just read the salutations. Who you think they talking to? They talking to the church. My friends earlier, earlier when I talked about tweets words and, and how true they were, I mentioned how they are exactly the sentiment that scripture provides us as it relates to false teachers. So what I want to do, I just want to, I want to, I want to read, I want to read a few verses. As soon as I find what page I'm on. I want to read a few verses that kind of support my thesis tonight and kind of gives you a really strong biblical basis for what I'm saying, why am I saying it, and why it's not my opinion, right? The thing about it is, is that false teachers are exactly who scripture describes them to be. So here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, here's what it says. It says, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also describe, disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Y'all, the Bible is so comforting because it is telling us that these men are deceitful workmen who are playing a role, right? This, this is an act for them. This is why they can be up in Tweet's daughter's DMs and then up in somebody's pulpit on Sunday. Like, hello? This is why. Because what they do on Sunday is a performance, Right? They're playing a role, just disguising themselves as an angel of light, just like Satan. So don't come for me saying that I am ungracious and that I'm being unloving by calling this mess out. No, because if the Bible describes such a person as a deceitful workman that does not represent a true apostle, apostle with a lowercase a, just to be specific, but rather it says that these types of people are servants of Satan. How on earth do you want me to be buddy, buddy and cozy up with a servant of Satan? Like, are you crazy? No, I'm not doing that. 